much. Yeah, but my work is, is local. I basically work. I basically work in my backyard, um, which I encourage you all to do. And in this case, my backyard is mostly uh, the Yasuni National Park. This talk is not so much. Are we going to turn those lights down? This talk is not so much about photography. As far as I'm concerned, it's about a place, a very, very special place. But then it's about a conservation photographer who has tried uh, to help, but essentially has failed. And I'll kind of tell you why. Where is Yasuni? Well, if you, this is the Yasuni National Park, this horseshoe shaped here. It's about a million hectares. Uh, this is Warani territory, a, an indigenous tribe that lives in the forest. This is an uncontactable uh, tribes, two uncontactable tribes living in here, the Tagayere and Taramanani. It's called the intangible zone, i.e. nobody is supposed to ever go in there. This uh, line on the outside is all Yasuni Biosphere Reserve, okay? National, <coughs> National Park in here, Biosphere Reserve out there, all in the setting of Ecuador. It's a lowland rainforest, it's primary Amazon, and it's just an absolutely uh, stunning place. The Amazon in general is it's just worthy of conservation in general because basically the Amazon uh, is full of water. 97% of the world's water is salty. Uh, the remaining 50% 50, 50 of that 3% that's left is held in the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon is a huge producer of oxygen uh, which we all need to breathe and it's also a great center for carbon sequestration. So that is enough. We should all be just down on our knees right now and paying reverence to the Amazon rainforest. But when you look at Yasuni in particular, and you overlay the peak diversity for four groups, uh, which is basically in this case birds, mammals, and amphibians, this is from a PLOS One paper of, uh, written by friends of mine working in the Amazon. Those four groups overlap. Where is this thing? There. Exactly where the Yasuni is. That red is the overlapping of four peak groups of biodiversity. This place is infinitely special. It's basically a, a three-dimensional habitat. It's got huge amount of niches uh, all over the place. It's a very, very complex ecosystem. And that's really what helps about uh, having this high biodiversity. It's got huge trees. It's a primary rainforest. They're not as big as the redwoods in the northwest. Uh, but they've got these major buttress roots, basically because the Amazon is actually built on a poor soil. But if we look at the tree species, there's approximately, I'm going to give you some figures now to try and explain how biodiverse the Yasuni is. There's approximately 650 tree species per hectare in the Yasuni rainforest. Okay? In the whole of the USA and Canada, there's 560 species. So in one hectare, what is a hectare for you in the US? A hectare is 100 by 100 meters. That's the size of the floor of a, of a football stadium. It's the size of a city block. More tree species in that area than in the entire USA and Canada. If you take the plants in general, this is called the hot lips flower. There's 1,500 species in one hectare of plants. It, it's very hard to comprehend these things. I'm going to keep hitting you uh, with some ideas of how diverse this is. And that doesn't even include the fungi. Okay. If you look at the mammals, this is uh, it's a mother tapir with her young. There's 200 species of mammals in the Yasuni National Park. The whole of the US and Canada, 462. So in one little national park, a million hectares, half as many mammals as in the entire US and Canada, which is very mammal rich, actually. Uh, but it's not only the the diversity, we've actually got huge biomass also in the Yasuni. That includes 10 species of primates, uh, squirrel monkeys such as this, which unfortunately are threatened by the pet trade and overhunting right now, and then uh, howler monkeys and all kinds of uh, monkeys. But basically, lots of interesting things that you might not know. This is a giant armadillo, carapace length, length, something like that, 32 kilos. This is a direct shot, it's not a camera trap. And it was just so special for me to find it. It's the first and only one I've ever seen. Very, very special indeed to finally meet one of these 
denizens of the forest at night uh, wandering around. So it, it's, it's a remarkable place. And every single time I go there, I'm surprised. I see new species undescribed by science. And I see new things every single day of every visit. We've got bats, lots and lots of bats. We've got over 100 species of bats in the Yosemite. And by reference, the USA and Canada has only got 47. You're getting the idea, yeah? Birds, 600 species in the Yasuni National Park, 600 species. USA and Canada combined, 925. And that includes a whole plethora of parrots, dusky-headed parakeets, and a clalic, uh, to really cool, strange birds like the hoatzin, uh, for example, that we have there as well. Getting down into some of my favorite groups, amphibians. Uh, we've got, in one hectare, remember, 100 by 100 meters, a guy called William Juhlman, scientist, discovered 87 species of amphibians in one hectare. That's three times the amount of the entire Western Europe. Okay? That hectare is now gone. It's disappeared. But it includes all the uh, you know, reptiles. We've got 120 species of reptiles in the Yasuni. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes, basically. Uh, Caligo snake there. And then uh, terrapins, caimans. But this is an interesting photo because there's five or six species of butterfly on that terrapin. I mean, you talk about biodiversity. It's unbelievable. Hang on. And it's the insects that really make Yasuni so special. I mean, I, what I've just described is special enough. But in one hectare, there's 100,000 species of insects, 100,000, which is equivalent to the entire United States to Canada once again. It's a good reference. Almost everything you've got, we've got in a hectare. <laughs> I mean, it's true. So politicians, of course, they say, okay, well, look, let's save a couple of hectares. We get 200,000 species out of it. But we all know it doesn't work like that. And what we need is the, uh, the whole ecosystem, which is what's under threat right now. I mean, cool stuff like this. This is Erodus moth. Look at the way it, it just builds this beautiful golden silken cage and dangles. They, they hit you in the face as you walk through the forest sometimes. You know. One of the coolest things I ever found was, was this. It is a viper mimic. Look at the head scalation pattern. Even got the vertical pupil of a viper. Beautiful eyes. The shading for the narrow uh, sort of triang triangular neck effect and the whole thing. Yet this is the chrysalis of a butterfly. You touch it and it wiggles like a snake. It makes me jump back. I mean, the, it's, it's so surprising, so amazing. The, the depth and the, the, the sort of the extent to which things have undertaken evolution. The niches are so, so narrow. There's so much diversity. If you're seen, you're eaten. So you've got this incredible system which, where everything is alive. You just don't see it, basically. But there's so much stuff to find. I mean, I'm guessing you're all seeing the cater did there, just up in the leaf. And that's how Yasuni is. It's just an absolutely phenomenal place. Just, I mean, look at this. How can you evolve that? You know, it, it blows me away. I promise you, it blows me away. It's a special, special place. There's a group of four, there are three catedids up the tent, and a moth right here. Look at that. Unbelievable. I mean, I'm not talking about the photo, just the act of taking it so far to want to camouflage yourself and see and be seen and the, the you know, anyway. And apart, so apart from the insects, we've got uh, cool stuff like arachnids, and uh, this is a, 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 a whiptail scorpion. And... 100,000 species in one hectare. We've got, they reckon, because not every hectare is the same, and there's not even much overlap between hectares. We've got about a million species, is the best guess, in Yasuni. In the entire planet, there's 9 million species. So we've got more than 10% of all the world's species in Yasuni. I'm not going to say another word for about five seconds, so that sinks in. It's phenomenal. I mean, it, it's just unbelievable. It's ridiculous. It shouldn't, it shouldn't happen, but it does. So you get the idea. It's truly an amazing place. 20 years ago, odd, 
I was living in the rainforest for, I was guiding out there as a guide. I, I met Rene. Uh, we got married there. And things were very beautiful, idyllic. We loved the forest. But then gradually we started noticing that there, were, uh, there was increased boat traffic. There was uh, speedboats going up on the rivers. There was uh, barges coming on the rivers. There were uh, helicopters flying overhead. There was urban sprawl growing up in cocoa. And we started thinking, well, what is going on here? And of course, the answer was oil. There's enough oil in the Yasuni National Park to fuel the entire United States for, guess what, 40 days. So the Yasuni is under severe threat from oil, and it's going to keep this place going if it was only used from Ecuador for 40 days. This is the trade-off that we're talking about. Last time I showed this map, many of you, I'm sure, would have noticed all these yellow lines everywhere. These are all oil concessions. So on top of all that protection that I've just described, IFCM, Biosphere Reserve, etc., 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 everywhere you look is an oil concession. This major road, this is called the Via Alca, built in the 1970s. This goes into the core, the heart of the Yasuni Biosphere Reserve. And it's absolutely trash down here. It's an oil service road. It, it now takes out illegal logs. It, uh, it brings in prostitutes. Uh, for the oil workers and, and the people that now live there. It's, it's just a terrible, horrible place. This is the Via Maxis. I'll show you just now. We'll talk about that. This is Block 31. We'll talk about that. And this is the ITT Block, 10% uh, or so of the, of the Yasini National Park. The Tagayeri and Taramanani, they, the, the government once overflew and identified from high-flying aircraft points of settlement of these uncontacted tribes. They are now officially gone from the government maps. They don't exist anymore, apparently. It, it just bodes to the fact that we're going to start moving into this area very soon. We are all sure. We're convinced in Ecuador. So it's a whole different map if you look at it from, from that perspective. The question here today is what could a conservation photographer do about it? Well, back in 1995, 10 years before I even knew I was a conservation photographer, uh, Rene and I, we published uh, this book called Amazon Images. It was the first ever book, actually, that came out about the Ecuadorian Amazon. And its, it, its market was the Ecuadorian people. What we tried to do, uh, it was our first ever book as well, but what we tried to do was just celebrate uh, the Yasuni, try and get rid of this image, this stereotype that the Ecuadorian people had. As I say, my work is entirely local. I mean, I'm working on the, the Ecuadorian people, and I believe you cannot conserve anything until you give these local people a sense of pride of what they've got. So this is the whole idea, trying to build it up from the bottom. We were trying to raise awareness uh, and, and, and change that uh, stereotype that they had. And, but we included the negatives. This is the Maxis Road, photographed in slide many years ago, 1994. You can see it's not an insignificant little thing. This is a major road going into the heart of the most biodiverse place on the planet. It's pretty bad. And all the negative predictions that I've put in that book, they've all way long since come true. So then there was an ITT initiative where the government of Ecuador said, OK, look, it was a great initiative. We all wholeheartedly supported it. Uh, and we did this book uh, to support the initiative. Basically, the, the, the government said, the ITT reserve is worth uh, $7 billion. You, the Western world, give us $3.5 billion, and we will uh, leave the oil underground and suffer the consequences of the rest. So uh, the Warani, these people, these jungle Indians, the phenomenal people, we put this book out because we wanted to show, uh, explain their culture to the local people, explain what is going to be lost if we go in and, and try to do this. The Warani had the low, they are on the lowest of the low ranking in the Ecuadorian social uh, system, and nobody really likes the Warani. They're just savages that kill missionaries, according to most people, but they are fantastic. So. We got uh, Trudy Style and Sting on board. That gave it more gravitas to, to the Ecuadorian people because nobody really wanted to even open a book about the Ecuadorian running. There's some out there that you can have a look at later. But, um, but as soon as they see Sting's name on board, uh, then they kind of open it. So it all sort of trying to generate interest for the people. But as I say, they, they've got very little uh, value to the Ecuadorian community. We wanted to show uh, their, their culture, the way they live, the fact that they're very human, they've got a great sense of humor. Um, it's, it's just fantastic to be with them, that they're not savages. I wanted to show their prowess in the jungle. They've got incredible 
uh, field skills, incredible knowledge of the jungle. And uh, so, as I said, we put this book out, and it was a success. This was something that I could actually tick because the, the, the government, the president came along and he saw the book and he said, uh, I need that book. And he did a presidential copy. He was the official gift to the OPEC member nations when he was trying to describe uh, what we were going to lose if we uh, went in and, and did the ITT. And of course, uh, it was all back to reference with the, um, with the Tagere and Tanamanani, the two uncontacted tribes as well. It wasn't enough. We did another book. This is the first ever book written by a Warani uh, Indian that ever, has ever come out. And, and I did all the photos for this book. Again, trying to just basically elevate their status. And lastly, this is a, it's just a campaign. This is not a project. I mean, a lot of you will hear about projects later, but this is a campaign. It's ongoing. But we are failing. We're losing the war. We did this, this last book. Uh, Kelly Swing, he's a, a top scientist uh, in, the, in the Yasuni region. So we, uh, we used Kelly as a co-author, got Ed Wilson on board. He's a rock star of biodiversity. This is a book about biodiversity and what we're going to lose. That's also out there as well if you want to have a look at it. Uh, and it, again, it became the first ever coffee table book to uh, have scientific arguments, but written for the layman. So it was trying to give fuel. The ITT initiative was failing. We were trying to give fuel to the people so that they could argue on their own. I'm a foreigner. I have no... I'm not allowed to say anything. I'm not allowed to get involved in politics in Ecuador. It, it's, it's just, I could talk to you in private about all the things that are going on, but I'm not allowed to do it. I have to be very careful of what I say. But we ask things like, why is there a $40 million bridge being built from Coca across into the heart of the Yasuni there? We don't need it. We've got a little bridge already. It's perfectly good. $40 million to put more people, more stuff into the heart of the Yasuni. The ITT failed in 2013 and basically, uh, all is being lost. And it's roads that are a problem. If you look at 1986, 2011, you can see the, the roads, that are, how they're being colonized. This is the, uh, the Via Alca Road. Uh, very, very quickly, it just gets overrun. Once you've got roads into a system, you've got people coming in. They hunt everywhere. Uh, and now what's happening in the, in the Maxis Road, which is inside of the park, the Warani Indians is coming in. They are hunting on the road. They're giving oil. They're getting oil cars, oil engi petrol engines, uh, oil boats. They're hunting, instead of carrying uh, a peccary on the shoulder, they're taking it all to the road. They're hunting a 100 kilometer swathe. They're taking it to market across the river. They're getting drunk and eating tuna fish. And all this for the sake of 40 days of fuel for the Yasuni. I mean, I've talked to top officials in the government. I talked to Tom Lovejoy the other week. He's trying to persuade uh, President, uh, not president, but just low, below the present ministers to go into Peru to show the offshore inland model. This is what we're trying to say to the people, the people of Ecuador, the governments. Use the offshore inland model. No roads. We're all happy. Conservationists are happy. The Ecuadorian people are happy to get the oil. The president's happy he goes green. It will cost more to the oil company, but oil company, you're still going to make billions of dollars of profit. And then uh, you can add benefit to your company because you, you're shown to be green. And this is what happens, basically. It's just this insipid colonization. This is right at the beginning of the colonization along the Maxis Road. But it's illegal. It's inside the park. This, just, these little things annoy me like crazy. I'm in D.C. now. I'm in the capital of the U.S., basically. You have influence, you people here. But this is like you've heard moths to a flame. This is a 60-foot flame in the jungle. Insects come from miles and miles and miles to get burned and incinerated in this flame. It'll cost 100 bucks to put a, a flameless sleeve on that thing. The oil companies are so callous right now, they don't even do that. And every three days, a bulldozer comes down here in a 20-foot radius, scoops up needy insects that are completely changing the forest. In fact, these guys are getting burned. Nobody knows how much they're changing. Nobody seems, apparently, to care. Just a quick example. Uh, I've got to finish now, but the jaded public view. This is the first ever picture, most likely, of a black jaguar ever photographed in the wild. I can't sell it. Nobody's interested in wildlife. I sold it in the first time in a statement last month, $1.40. This is the holy grail of Amazon photography. If you're ever going to shoot anything, what you want to do most is get a black jaguar. And I'm face to face with this guy. It's not even a counter trap. Nobody cares. There's nobody cares. So what can I do next? What is my next thing? Well, here I am standing here. I'm trying to take the same rhetoric to new audiences. That's you guys. But my big thing is... Where are the NGOs? There's no NGOs. There's none of these big bingos. There's nobody working on the SD. Everybody's too scared of the government. Nobody wants to get involved. And 
we've got a problem. It's the most biodiverse place on the planet. More, pe more species are saved here than anywhere else, or lost by, this, uh, by destruction of this forest. But nobody's there. And this is not a project, like I say, it's an appeal. It's a call to action. I need you guys to help. I need the NGOs to get in there, take the problem on, get involved in the politics, beat the politics, make it a national concern. Because I can't. I'm not allowed to do it. I'm a resident of Ecuador. I cannot. I will be in Big Mantata. So, we're watching. Thank you.